Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Fonesh, and welcome to this presentation from the NSF NAC Center entitled The World of Nanotechnology and Introduction. A little bit of uh, background on myself. I'm uh, uh, interested in education as well as research uh, here at Penn State. My research uh, uh, in, in, in encompasses work in nanotechnology, sensors, microelectronics, and uh, also in solar cells, and I've written two books in those areas and have co-authored with my students over 250 articles uh, in journals. I also have uh, uh, hold or co-hold with my students 29 patents, and uh, I've uh, founded two nanotechnology-based companies. I'm also a fellow, a life fellow of the IEEE and a fellow of the Electrochemical Society. Well, we're going to talk about nanotechnology, as we said, and a good place to start is, what does the word nanotechnology mean? And it refers to uh, a technology based on things that are obviously really, really small. To be more precise about it, uh, it's a technology based on particles and structures which have at least one dimension in the range of one billionth of a meter. One billionth of a meter is a nanometer. So nanotechnology things have at least one dimension in the nano range. And the word nano, the nano range, nanometer, nanoscale, uh, can be really brought into better perspective if we compare it with, let's say, things that we're familiar with. So one thing we can compare a nanometer with is, is, a, is an average human hair. We think of an average human hair as being very thin, but actually it's 100,000 nanometers across. So that's kind of a way to get an idea of how small a nanometer is. It takes 100,000 of them to equal the diameter of the average human hair. So let's take a look at small sizes pictorially and let's get an idea of what man makes and what nature makes at different size ranges. Well, this uh, shows us different size scales. We see the macro scale up here. We see the micro scale here. And we see the nano scale down here. And then below the nano scale, we could call this the pico scale down here. And we see on the bottom things that nature makes at these different scales. For example, at the macro scale, we have tissue. Uh, we have uh, uh, lots of things that uh, are, are, are common. Uh, for example, the human hair we were talking about. <clears throat> if you get into the micro scale, you can see that a typical human cell is up here in the upper part of the micro scale. Uh, and then a bacterium cell, which is smaller than a typical human cell, is down here in the micro scale. And then you can see uh, we have this boundary, sort of a transition into the nano scale down here at 100 nanometers. And then if we go into the nano scale, we can see that nature makes the viruses in this size range. This is uh, about, uh, well, it's a pretty big nanoparticle. But a virus is a molecule, but also it's a fairly big nanoparticle. And then we see proteins are down in this part of the nanoscale. You get all the way down to this lower part of the nanoscale. Then we have DNA, which is about, uh, well, about 2.5 nanometers in diameter. So down here in the lower part of the nanoscale. Then there's nothing here. And then finally we get down to atoms way down here, about 100, pico, 100 picometers is the size of the average atom. And here is a depiction of the average atom down here, but of course it's very, very small, about 100 picometers. Now let's see what we humans have been doing in these different scales. Well, up here 
Well, there's lots of things we make at the, at the macro scale, uh, and uh, we, we, we needn't talk about that, but if we get down into the micro scale, we can talk about transistors. This is where transistors were 20 to 30 years ago in the micro scale. In fact, that's why we say microelectronics, because the transistor started out in the micro scale. And so that's a transistor of 20 or 30 years ago. The transistors of four or five years ago were down here in the nano scale. So I guess really we should change the name of microelectronics to nanoelectronics, but we probably pretty much leave it called leave it, leave it as microelectronics. But really, microelectronics has morphed into nanoelectronics. So that's where transistors are today. We make drug molecules. There's way down here in the nano scale, and we make quantum dots. Those are particles uh, made of semiconductors, and and those are down here. It's interesting to see that the quantum dot, which is a man-made structure, a particle made of semiconductor, semiconductor materials, is much, much smaller than the virus molecule, which is a, a, a dot, if you will, a particle, uh, a molecule made by nature. So we can see from our pictorial representation that, uh, as I mentioned, the next scale smaller than the nanoscale is the picoscale. So lots of folks say to me, well, does that mean that you know, 10 years from now we'll be talking about PICO technology? And the answer to that is, I don't think so. <coughs> Excuse me, the, the PICO scale range is really the atoms as we saw. That's about all that's going on at the PICO scale range. And so really what we're dealing with is the periodic table and the various elements. Now there are some things in the periodic table that are man-made. Some of these uh, very heavy uh, atoms are, are man-made, but uh, I mean, this is all there is at the, at the Pico scale, just atoms. And if, the, if you want to talk about an industry at the Pico scale, I guess the only industry is the nuclear industry. Uh, but there's not much to do. There isn't anything to do. This is what you're working with. This is what nature has. Yes, we can make a few man-made atoms. But they only live, if you'll uh, allow me to use the term, a nanosecond or less, a femtosecond. So they're really not uh, of any consequence. So what's after nanotechnology? Is there pico technology? Well, as I said earlier, no, there's nothing really much to do at the pico scale. <clears throat> at the nanoscale, there's lots to do, lots to build. And at the nanoscale, you put things together. You can use atoms and molecules as Legos, put them together, and make different structures. So the creating of things at the nanoscale for the benefit of mankind is what we call nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is the builder's final frontier. This is a quote which I think is, which I think says it all. It's from Richard Smalley, uh, a, a, a professor of chemistry at Rice University and uh, a winner of the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1996 for his work with buckyballs uh, and other nanoparticles. So I think he captured it very well with this, nanotechnology is the builder's final frontier. So is nanotechnology new? This is a question that folks often ask, and uh, the answer is no. It's actually been practiced by humans for a very long time. Uh, we know that a, a cup made by the Romans 1,700 years ago used nanotechnology. And we just found out, because we just developed the tools to actually see the nanoparticles they used. And here's the cup. It's called the Lycurgus cup. And as I said, it was made about 1,700 years ago. And uh, it's very interesting in that if you have in, uh, light impinging on it and reflect it, uh, the light, the, the cup appears green. But if you put a light source inside it or behind it, then the cup appears red. So it's green when it reflects light. 
uh, and when you transmit light through it, it's red. And we know today how the Romans were doing this. They had nanoparticles in the glass, and the nanoparticles we know today to be, have been, or are, are gold and silver, and they're embedded in the silica glass, uh, setting up a phenomenon called plasmons. Plasmons is a very interesting phenomenon. I'll talk about it more. It's a small metal nanoparticle that interacts with light, and as you can see, bounces back some of the light and lets some of the other light go through. And we'll talk about that more. And this phenomenon only happens at the nanoscale. We don't know how the Romans made their nanoparticles, but uh, if you're interested in learning how we have found out about their nanoparticles and even know the size, you can go to this reference listed here. So we know that uh, <coughs> the Romans used, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we know that the Romans used nanoparticles in glass, uh, and we know that uh, the beautiful stained gla glass windows that are found in European cathedrals uh, as, as far back as 800 years ago also used nanoparticles, also used nanotechnology. Here is a stained glass window in the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, and this is a beautiful window which I've had the pleasure of seeing. It's gorgeous, and uh, you see, you, you can get some idea of the colors, the vibrant colors in that window, and they are also caused by metal nanoparticles in the glass. So you're, again, you're seeing these plasmons, an effect that only takes place at the nanoscale, giving this beautiful color, known to the uh, Europeans of the Middle Ages as long as 800 years ago. So we also know that there were some beautiful plates made by the Renaissance Italians about 500 years ago that also used nanotechnology. And again, we've just found out because we've been able to, with the beautiful tools we have today, that can see things at the nanoscale. We've used those tools to go in and find how they were doing it to find out that they were making these beautiful colors with nanoparticles. And here are some examples. This is some 16th century Renaissance pottery, and you can see that in places they were using copper nanoparticles, and in other places they were using silver nanoparticles to get these different colors. Uh, and uh, you can see that, uh, uh, or, or that there's a reference here that you can uh, acquire and read and find out more about how we have done this analysis to prove that this beautiful color, this beautiful pattern is coming from the use of nanoparticles. By the way, I think it's interesting to, to notice that these nanoparticles have been here in this glass for almost a thousand years, and they haven't caused anybody any problems. In fact, you could go up and lick that glass and those nanoparticles wouldn't bother you, uh, which drives home the point, I think, that nanoparticles per se are certainly not dangerous if they're used in the uh, proper situation. So nanotechnology's been around for a long time. Why is it taking off now? Why now? Why is nanotechnology so big now? Because we have learned what's going on and how to control it and see it, uh, we can now make, and are now making, a great deal of progress with nanotechnology. The Romans, for example, could not see the nanoparticles that they were using. The uh, people in the Middle Ages could not see the nanoparticles they were using, didn't know how they were distributed, didn't know their size, nor did the Renaissance Italians. But today, we can controllably and repeatedly make these nanoparticles. We can make all sorts of things at the nanoscale. And most importantly, I think, we can now see what we're doing. That's why we have this tremendous increase in progress in nanotechnology. So today, we can controllably and repeatedly make things in the nanoscale range, and we can see what we have made. For example, just to give you an idea of how controllably and how repeatedly, uh, repeatably uh, uh, we can make things, uh, let's take a look at today's transistors. 
Today's transistors, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, are really at the nanoscale. We mentioned that electronics should really be called nanoelectronics today. And the, the transistors in production are as small as 30 nanometers in length. Very, very small, very, very small structures. And we can make tremendous numbers of these transistors. In fact, today, more nanoscale transistors are made in a year than we humans grow grains of rice. So, wow, we can really control manufacturing at the nanoscale, and we can make it repeatable uh, at the nanoscale. We can see what we're doing. We've really learned how to build at the nanoscale. Here's a picture of a, a transistor, and I, I have to tell you, this is an old one. Uh, you can see the age of this transistor, uh, but you can see that the gate is 50 nanometers. The distance from here to here is 50 nanometers. And the transistor, this is a, this is a MOSFET. And this transistor works by, let's say, electrons coming in here. <clears throat> if there's a positive voltage on the gate, the electrons will find this a very appealing region. They'll go through here and they'll go out the source. If we put a negative voltage on the gate, then the electrons will not come down in here, and they won't go out here. So positive voltage, the electrons run through, that's on. Po uh, negative voltage, the electrons can't go through here, that's off. So we have the 1, the 0, the only off of microelectronics. But again, the thing to see here is, at this date, this early date, 50 nanometers is this length, and you can see the sizes of of, this is much less than 50 nanometers, and you can see some of the characteristic layers here. And you can see these are very thin layers, and so this is beautiful engineering going on at uh, scales that are much less than 100 nanometers, and this is, this is sort of old technology, if you will. This is not where we are today. So we can see what we've made. By the way, here's a picture of what we've made. This is a transistor. Let me just tell you uh, how it's made. The chip has the transistors on it. The chip is cut, and so now we have lots of transistors here. And then we look in. In this case, we're looking with a field emission, field emission scanning electron microscope, and we can actually see the individual transistors. So this is some of the beautiful tools we have to be able to see its sizes such as 50 nanometer C, very readily. So we could see what we've made, and it's so good, our, our tools are so good at seeing that we can actually uh, visualize uh, uh, atoms uh, today. So nanotechnology is now manufacturable. Uh, we can produce things in huge numbers and economically, and we can make products that have new and unique properties and capabilities. The Romans didn't have manufacturability down. They couldn't make things in large numbers. Uh, and uh, I think probably what they were doing was breaking up gold foils and silver foils. So I'm not so sure how economical their process was. But today, our processes are very economical. They're very controllable. And we can see what we're doing. So we have process control. We have manufacturing control. So why is nanotechnology so useful? Okay, it's been around, but now we can really control it. Now we can see what we're doing. Well, why is it so useful? Because nanotechnology products have new and unique properties and capabilities. Well, if that's true, why is it true? And it's true because at the nanoscale, new doors open, new phenomena, and new opportunities become accessible. I've already mentioned one, those plasmons. So we'll talk more about these doors, these new phenomena, and these new opportunities. The sources of the new opportunities are these unique properties that are available at the nanoscale. First of all, an obvious property, the structures are very small. And uh, that means 
that you can get many of them in a square centimeter if you so choose. That's why engineers love small transistors, because then they can put many, many, many transistors in a square centimeter, which means a consumer has a faster computer, more memory, better displays, so there's a tremendous drive to make the transistors smaller and smaller and smaller. So small size is an obvious advantage. Uh, the high surface to volume ratio is unique. What I mean by that is if I have a, a, a bar of gold in our world, most of the atoms are inside. But if I have a tiny nanoparticle of gold, let's suppose that's a nanoparticle of gold, many of the atoms, if not most, see the atoms here? These little bumps? Many of the atoms are on the surface. That means they're very different than the atoms inside. If an atom's inside a, a bar of gold, it's it's got other gold atoms sitting around it, you know, lots of friends. But notice this atom right here doesn't have any gold atoms on its right side. So its properties are different. And that means that you can have some unique things happening at the nanoscale where you have so many atoms on the surface. And you can have, for example, some unique catalytic properties. Catalysts, of course, catalysts are used um, in, in, in manufacturing processes. Catalyst is used in your catalytic converter to try to cut down the pollution from your car. So catalysts are used uh, in many situations, and the more efficient they are, the better off we are from an environmental and from an energy utilization standpoint. So things like the high surface to volume ratio afforded by the small size of nanoparticles um, is a very, very attractive and very unique. Also at the nanoscale, surface forces dominate over bulk forces. And a very nice example of that is for a nanoparticle, gravity is not important. If I were to turn a nanoparticle loose, it would float forever, just bouncing around. Unless it met another nanoparticle and they agglomerated. But if that didn't happen, it would bounce around forever. One of Einstein's famous three papers from 1905 discussed this random motion of particles such as this. So one of his papers dealt with nanotechnology. Gravity is not important. This nanoparticle will just bounce all around unless some surface forces come into play and it meets another nanoparticle. But if that doesn't happen, as Einstein's work pointed out in 1905, if they bulk forces, the gravity forces aren't important, or not important, this will just bounce around forever unless it, in, in, uh, it encounters some surface forces such as a friend that it agglomerates with. So that's a very unique situation. And then at the nanoscale, quantum mechanics is important. And quantum mechanics, as you know, is, is a, this, this world of probabilities and this world of uh, energy gaps and and uh, uh, tunneling where electrons go through places that classically they never would. This is very unusual world. Well, that world, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that world is very important uh, in the nanoscale. And um, here you see some semi semiconductor nanoparticles. And by changing the size of the nanoparticles, we can change the color uh, of the semiconductor. So if we have light, uh, color emitted by the semiconductor, if we have light coming down, then that, let's suppose this is UV, ultraviolet, and that impacts on a small particle, then that small particle, that quantum dot, as it's called, because of quantum mechanical effects, will emit blue light. But if that same light comes down and hits a larger particle, particle then it will emit, let's say, red light. In other words, the smaller the particle, the higher the frequency of the light. The larger the particle, the lower the frequency of the light. Another quantum mechanical effect and, 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 and a wave effect also that occurs at the nanoscale that these are these plasmons that we were talking about when we were discussing the Romans. The way this works is light, visible light, is a wave 
uh, and uh, we're talking about wave properties. And it's a wave where um, when the wave is up, amplitude is up here, let's say the electric field is pointing that way. When the amplitude is here, there's no electric field. When the amplitude is here, down like this, the electric field's pointing downwards. And if you take a metal nanoparticle, now let's say this is like maybe 500 nanometers, typical you know, 500, 600, 700 nanometers, the wavelength of visible light. If I take a nanoparticle, that's really small compared to this wavelength. So the fact that these metal particles are full of free electrons, which can slosh, and the fact that they're so small compared to the wavelength gives rise to these plasmons, which, as we mentioned, the Romans were exploiting. Of course, they didn't know about this, uh, but uh, they just knew they got these different colors depending on whether the light was reflected or transmitted. We know today that's due to plasmons, and we know it's due to these wave properties of light, as well as quantum mechanical properties of the plasmons sloshing back and of the electrons sloshing back and forth inside the metal. And such effects, this light sloshing back and forth, can give rise to very strong electric fields, very strong uh, uh, light regions, concentrated light regions around the nanoparticle. You can see the nanoparticles are located here, and you can see where the nanostructures are located here, uh, and you can see this, uh, the strong colors. And you can see, by the way, that uh, from here to here is 200 nanometers, so these are very, very small structures. This particular case is not a nanoparticle, it's nanostructures in metal films giving rise through the same physics, giving rise to plasmons. So you can see the plasmons here. Well, more about the unique properties of, of uh, the nanoscale. We, we are able to make sizes that correspond to basic biological structures. We mentioned that we're able to make particles that are much smaller than viruses that are the size of DNA and, and uh, of the size of some very basic structures in cells. Uh, we can make uh, particles that are obviously the size of macromolecules. At the uh, nanoscale, you also have very unique chemical bonding. Uh, for example, at the nanoscale, nature will allow you to take a roll of a, 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 a layer of graphene and will allow it to be rolled up into a carbon nanotube. And so this is some very unique chemical bonding that is possible at, and only possible at the nanoscale, where this is the nano dimension. And then new epistemologies, new ways of knowing things. I've mentioned tools already like field emission, scanning electron microscope. We saw some pictures, lots of tools, atomic force microscopes. These all use nanotechnology themselves to be able to see what we're doing. And um, for example, the FE and FESEM stands for, this is a tunneling phenomenon, quantum mechanical phenomenon operating at structures that are in the nanoscale. So the actual tool uses a nanoscale, and then we use the tool to visualize the nanoscale. This, of course, uses probes at the nanoscale. Tips of these probes are at the nanoscale, and then we use them to actually visualize at the nanoscale. And just a practical, example of, of the impact of this uh, uh, of this property up here, unique chemical bonding, is, for example, the use of carbon nanotubes in structural materials. Uh, here in this bike, all the structural uh, parts of this bike were made using carbon nanotube composites. So what are some of the accomplishments of nanotechnology? We know its history, we know why it's so big today, we know why it's unique. Uh, okay, so what has it done for us so far in this past uh, 10, 15 years when it's really matured and is developing and is becoming a real tool of, of uh, mankind? What, what, what's, its, what's, its, what's been accomplished? Well, here's a very practical example, better packaging. And here we see a lot of different pro uh, products using plastics and uh, there is a lot of use of nanoparticles in plastics. For example, in this schematic, we see clay particles. Clay is a naturally occurring nanoparticle. The dimensions this way and this way tend to be in the micron scale, 
but the thickness is in the nanoscale. So these are nanoparticles, clay nanoparticles, and they can be used in plastics to stop oxygen from getting in and, and uh, hurting food. These will block oxygen diffusion in through the plastic. Uh, so you can keep food fresher, as you see here. You can also put silver nanoparticles on the clay. You can functionalize the clay. Functionalization is a fancy word saying, let's make a chemical bond between a silver nanoparticle and the clay so it sticks here, and functionalize silver nanoparticles here. Now, why? Well, it turns out that silver nanoparticles, <clears throat> because they're so small, uh, are very, very strong antimicrobial agents. So in this particular case, you not only have the clay stopping oxygen from getting in, but you have the antimicrobial action of the silver, which has been functionalized and attached to the clay. All of this gives rise to much better packaging materials for foods uh, to protect the food supply and to keep food fresher. Another example is uh, just better uh, structural materials and things like automobiles, lighter materials so we can get the gas mileage up, but, but just as strong if not stronger. And so uh, nano-based uh, composites are being used uh, in many different applications in automobiles, as you can see here. Another example is nanoelectronics. I said we should call electronics nanoelectronics instead of microelectronics, and, and um, it's re it really is nanoelectronics today. Here's a picture of a circuit, many, many, many transistors, and in this particular circuit, the transistors are 32 nanometers, uh, and, and uh, this is a, 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 a microprocessor from Intel. Here you see uh, a, 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 flash, a flash memory uh, uh, device from Freescale, and here it's using uh, uh, thin film storage. It's actually using silicon nanocrystals. So it's silicon, but it's not single crystals silicon. It's silicon made up of crystals, grains, which are at the nanoscale. The distance across one of these grains is you know, 5 nanometers, 10 nanometers, 80 nanometers. Uh, so it's a silicon nanocrystal that's being used. Here's a picture of it uh, for the memory material. And here's a magnetic random access memory, again, based on the, nanos, the nanoscale. Here, nanometer scale magnetic tunnel junction. We mentioned tunneling, quantum mechanics. Uh, we mentioned quantum mechanics is very uh, a very strong phenomenon at the nanoscale. And here you see that being exploited to make a magnetic random access memory. More products. Well, yep. How about uh, better imaging tools for biological applications? Here's a nanoparticle. <clears throat> you can see it's been functionalized. You see that. These things have been put on the surface. Now let me, let me go back to that. <clears throat> it's been functionalized, and you can see the molecules put on the surface, and it can be functionalized to go to places. In other words, it's kind of like um, putting a homing device on the nanoparticle. You can take that nanoparticle. You see this particular one is hollow inside, so you could store drugs in that or put in, in, in it whatever you want. You put a homing device, if you will, this mo these molecules on the surface, and these are engineered to go to certain, let's say, types of cells in the body, uh, uh, cancerous cells versus normal cells, or liver cells versus uh, pancreatic cells. Some way you build a molecule on the surface, you functionalize the nanoparticle so that it goes to a certain place for a certain use. And here we see it using nanoparticles like this for uh, studying cancer cells. So the, the green object you see in this film is a cancer cell, and we're going to watch and see how it gobbles up the human gro growth hormone, EGF. Now, let me tell you what we've done to the EGF, or not what we did, but what the people in the reference you see underneath the picture did. What they did was they used quantum dots, we talked about them before, and they picked a quantum dot size uh, that uh, allowed this uh, orange kind of light to come off uh, off of the quantum dot. And so the quantum dot was, you had light impinging on the quantum dot, blue light, as you see in the figure above, and the quantum dot was selected to give off orange 
light, the quantum dot was functionalized so that it, it was attached to the human growth hormone EGF. So we turned the human growth hormone loose in the solution around the cancer cell. See the orange? See the growth hormone coming? And watch the cancer cell suck up the growth hormone. Uh, if we watch it again, again you'll see the growth hormone, each growth hormone molecule carrying a quantum dot that gives off orange light. So you, here come, here comes. Now watch the cancer cell bring in those, uh, that human growth hormone carrying the orange light emitting quantum dot. What you see there is something biologists didn't know, and that is that cancer cell has growing from it uh, uh, structures uh, which um, uh, uh, have receptors. Uh, so the, those structures are called philopodia, and at the end of the philopodia are receptors, and these receptors have been placed at the end of the philopodia so that they can very effectively suck in the human growth hormone uh, EGF. So what biologists didn't know was that cancer cells, or at least some, have this type of receptors out on the extended philopodia. They didn't know that. Knowing it uh, helps uh, in the design of, of effective treatments, effective uh, def ways of intervening in this process of, of sucking in, of bringing in the human growth hormone. And this kind of information when, uh, was not available, was not known before the invention of these quantum dots, these nanoparticles that could be used uh, as a way of imaging what's going on in this cancer cell process. Let's look at uh, functionalized nanoparticles, not for basic biological research, but let's look at it for medical applications. And one medical application is better fluorescent imaging of tumors. And in this case, we see a mouse that has been uh, given or implanted three different types of tumors. One, two, three. And three different types of quantum dots. Uh, you can see this must be the smallest of the quantum dots. This must be the next biggest one. And this must be the biggest one. Because remember, the smaller the, uh, the smaller the wavelength of the light, and uh, the bigger, the longer the wavelength of the light. Red is the longest of these light colors here. And so three different sized quantum dots, and um, these quantum dots have been functionalized so that this type goes to this type of tumor, this type goes to this type of tumor, and this type goes to this type of tumor. So they're functionalized that way, they're injected into the mouse, and you can see they go around through the mouse's bloodstream, and indeed this type of quantum dot goes to that tumor. Func it's functionalized so it only goes to that tumor. Sure, it travels all around. Sure, it comes to this tumor, but it doesn't attach because it's been functionalized to just attach to this type of tumor. And this one, of course, travels around to the, uh, the body, but it only attaches to this type because of the way it's been functionalized. And this one, of course, travels around to the mouse's bloodstream, but only attaches to this type of tumor because of the way that it's been functionalized. So we can also, uh, you know, lots of ways of using nanoparticles. Let's talk about using them for better drug delivery. We just looked at imaging. How about drug delivery? Well, yes, we can take those nanoparticles and we can uh, have them carry drugs, and they're so small that they easily can come down through blood vessels, and around tumors there's usually larger spacings in the blood vessel, wall, blood vessel walls. That's an attribute of tumors. And so the nanoparticle could win. You can functionalize the nanoparticle to attach to the cancer cells. These are cancer cells. So these particles attach to the cancer cells, and they deliver a drug. Uh, so you can use the delivery system, and uh, in this particular case, also take advantage of the small size of the nanoparticle and the spacing in, the, in these pores in the uh, blood vessel walls to get the drug to the cancer cell. Uh, cancer, um, <coughs> excuse me, cancer treatments such as this are already clinically approved uh, and being used for some types of, of cancer. Uh, if you want to look and see about more products, for example, more types of uh, nanoparticle-based drugs that are used for cancer treatment or more materials, what have you, you can go to 
these different websites that you see here. Uh, the NIH, for example, uh, has its own website on nanotechnology where you can just see what's going on uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the use of nanotechnology in medicine. So these are some websites that you may find of, of interest. Well, look, we've looked at nanotechnology. We saw that people have been using it for a long time. We saw that it's uh, just emerged because we can actually see what we're doing now. We can actually work at that scale in a very controllable way. Uh, and uh, we can exploit the unique properties that are available at the nanoscale, the smallness, the quantum effects, the light effects, the unique chemistry. So given all those exciting uh, attributes of nanotechnology, does it have any dangers? And the answer is yes. Every technology has some dangers uh, that's just inherent in, in technology. And for example, the technology that uh, we've been using so much, fire for example, uh, we've used fire for as humans for how long? A long time. And uh, we all know that uh, just about every day we hear about someone whose house burns down or someone who's injured or perhaps killed in a fire. And I don't think we want to give up fire as a technology. I think we don't want to dare give up nanotechnology. Look at what it offers for medicine. Look at what it offers for new materials. Look at what it offers for basic understanding of biology. I don't think we want to give this up, but we have to be aware that, like any technology, it has to be carefully controlled. Now, okay, lots of wonderful things about nanotechnology. Uh, is everything that people say about it true? Uh, is there, I mean, are there any problems? Uh, are people over-hyping nanotechnology? Well, I, I think that there are things that people uh, say about nanotechnology that are just not feasible right now. One that comes to mind is this idea of nanobots that uh, are going to go down your artery walls here and are going to uh, clean out the artery walls uh, and, uh, you know, uh, render the uh, arteries um, completely free of any sort of deposits. And that's a neat idea, and uh, I certainly would like to see that happen, but um, I don't think that's in the near future. Uh, in fact, I don't know if it's in the future at all, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's possible. We can talk about it, but I certainly, there's certainly nothing around the corner, and uh, there may be no way around the corner. So I think we need to uh, be reasonable and we need to know what nanotechnology can do, what it can do today, what it should be able to do tomorrow, and be careful about what it might be able to do 10, 20, 30, 100 years from now. So what is the bottom line? What does nanotechnology have to do with our society and with our lives? Here's a list uh, put together uh, by Professor Smalley, a person that we talked about in the beginning of, the, of our discussion, a person who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And this is a list he put together in the Materials Research Society, Society Bulletin uh, in 2005. This is a list of what he considered to be the top ten world issues. And you see energy, water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism, and war disease, education, democracy, population. Well, among those 10 items, I think we can all agree that nanotechnology is going to make quite an impression, quite an, have quite an effect. We've already talked about catalysis and its ability to save energy, but it's also coming in through better batteries, better solar cells. It's a, it affects water uh, because nanotechnology makes these very small, uh, porous structures that can be used to filter water. It also affects food. We saw better packaging for food. Uh, there probably will be better ways of delivering pesticides and fertilizers to food too using nanotechnology vehicles in the future. But right now it's affecting just the packaging of food. The environment, big effects in the environment. Effects from um, less pollution because for example we use catalysts and we waste less uh, materials or uh, impact from using nanostructured materials to filter better to clean up the environment. Poverty, well, I think nanotechnology will create a better world, hopefully a 
uh, a world with uh, 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 manufacturing of high quality products, and certainly that can impact poverty and uh, people's standards of living. Terrorism and war, oh, definite impact uh, through sensors, various detection mechanisms, detection means using nanotechnology. Disease, I think we saw a lot of examples of nanotechnology being used to study diseases and nanotechnology being used in clinical applications by uh, physicians to actually treat diseases such as cancer. I don't know what it's going to have to do with education, democracy, or population, but I think you can see from here nanotechnology is definitely going to have a very, very big impact on society uh, and uh, our, our, the quality of our life. So nanotechnology is, is here. It's very important. Uh, it's a, a technology that I describe as 21st century material science uh, and technology.